So welcome everybody uh, to this uh, first webinar on pediatric urology. I will be moderating this uh, webinar and there will be three speakers. And the topics that we are going to be discussing is reflux and bladder dysfunction, uh, UPJ obstruction, megaureter hypospadias by Sardar Tegel from Ankara, urethral valves and neurogenic bladder by Dan Wood. We will have about five minutes for questions after each presentation. So I will start off with a broad topic, reflux and bladder dysfunction. I have no conflicts of interest. And as you can see on this slide, reflux is not just one entity. There are many ways people can present with reflux. There's a small hutch diverticulum or a prune belly or a duplex system, as you can see on the right. We would know that we find reflux in the pediatric population in about one to 2%. And in children who've been investigated for reflux, this number is about 30%. Now, why do we need to treat reflux? Uh, following the Second World War, a lot of soldiers came back with spinal cord injuries. And about two thirds of deaths were due to severe reflux and pyelonephritis. And it turned out that about 25% of those developed hydronephrosis initially with preserved function, but after a few years, reflux occurred and renal uh, impairment happened. And it was Hutch who recognized that reflux meant a grave danger to the function of the upper tract, and he developed an operation to correct it. In the 50s, both Ledbetter and Politano developed their operation, and some people are still using that nowadays, and they recognized that reflux was more complex in children because they sometimes also had a urethral seal they might have duplex systems, urethral valves, etc. And that was quite amazing because the imaging modalities they had at that time were much more limited than what we are used to nowadays. But they advised to correct the primary causes first and then reflux persisted, they would treat the reflux. We also know that reflux nephropathy is one of the most common causes of end stage renal disease in children. And many of them also had severe reflux, and most of them had urinary tract infections. In children with a neurogenic bladder, many developed hydronephrosis, reflux, renal scarring, chronic renal failure, and ultimately death. And it was the general belief at that stage that treating reflux surgically in normal children would save many kidneys and prevent end-stage renal disease. But how successful have we been? When you look at the outcome measures like uh, renal function and scars, recurrent infections, um, it became very apparent that many of the children with reflux nephropathy actually had renal dysplasia. And that is something we cannot cure. So in those children, aggressive treatment will not be very helpful. We also know that the percentage of children with reflux nephropathy in end-stage renal disease hasn't changed all that much. Reflux in otherwise normal children rarely leads to end-stage renal disease. And it's the abnormal kidneys that are at risk with spinal nephritis and scarring. In 1974, David Innes Williams said, reflux is an old hat. Now that we have a reliable operation to fix it, it's a boring subject to talk about it. But he also recognized that the more we looked for reflux, more, the more often we found it. And this was the real launching point for pediatric urology. We had a prospect of a surgical operation curing a common complaint. That was in 2003. And since then, many things have changed. But even earlier than that, it was a very smart pediatrician, Jane Smalley from London, who recognized that surgery might not be the only way to treat children with reflux. And she uh, started studying the long-term use of prophylactic antibiotics, 
in children with this reflux, and she noticed a spontaneous resolution rate of about 75% uh, without new scars appearing. There was also Jane Smelly, who published a paper in The Lancet in 2001 uh, from Great Ormond Street in London, where they compared 52 patients who had high-grade bilateral reflux plus nephropathy. So this is a high-risk group of patients. Half of them were operated and the other half only got antibiotic prophylaxis. And they followed these patients for a very long time. And at the end of the day, they found that both groups showed no difference. So surgery didn't really seem to benefit this particular group of patients. In the 70s, the international reflux study was started. And at the end of the day, and there was an American arm and a European arm, um, and there were some differences between the two arms, but mainly because uh, there were more obstructions in the reimplant group in Europe than in the US. Um, but they didn't really find any difference in outcomes between the medical and surgical groups, except that in the group that had surgery, less pyelonephritis occurred. Not UTIs, but uh, urinary tract infection this fever. So over the years, a lot of things have changed. And I'm not going to go over everything in this slide, but actually during the last 70 years, many things have evolved. From reflux and property, the introduction of surgical treatment, medical treatment, and that also meant that we could do some randomized controlled trials, prenatal diagnosis because ultrasound became widely available, the bladder dysfunction was studied because urodynamics became very important. And the last 20 to 25 years, we have been introduced with the endoscopic correction and the laparoscopic treatment of reflux. But the main thing that has changed is the concept. At first, reflux was considered to be very bad for the kidneys and aggressive treatment was always indicated towards a more conservative approach where reflux is considered to be a more benign condition and therefore it may not even need to be diagnosed. We also know that there are multi, uh, a lot of risk factors that eventually all have an impact on the kidney from intrarenal reflux, renal dysplasia and neurogenic bladder dysfunction. So reflux may cause renal scarring, hypertension, and renal failure. But most reflux patients do not form renal scars. Probably they don't need any intervention. Scar formation rates are similar in the different treatment approaches. The choice of treatment modality is based on the different advantages and disadvantages in relation to age, gender, and mode of presentation. And I will focus the rest of my uh, presentation on looking at the individual and doing risk stratification. Now, what do you need to know? Is there any best treatment option? Is the bladder function important? And the same is true for the bowel function. I will show you some slides on resolution, role of UTI, and bladder and bowel dysfunction. This is one of the many slides that I could show you. This is from the Swedish reflux study group um, about reflux resolution and renal damage. And what you can clearly see is if you have a normal bladder function, the rate of resolution is much higher than when you have avoiding this function. The same is also true for renal damage. The rate of renal damage is much lower when you have a normal bladder compared to an abnormal bladder. This is a slide that most of you probably know that the spontaneous resolution of reflux is much higher in low grade reflux compared on the top, uh, the reflux four and five. But this is also true, and this is an older study also from Sweden, if you compare the children with recurrent UTIs and bladder dysfunction in both cases, 
you can see that the rate of resolution is much slower. So there is a definite correlation between voiding dysfunction, bladder dysfunction in general, reflux, and the UTIs. And this is a very nice study that was uh, published this year. Uh, they did a meta-analysis of all the papers looking at children with primary reflux um, and the prevalence of bladder dysfunction and bowel dysfunction. They looked at 43 studies and they found that 49% of all the children had lower urinary tract dysfunction. And if in the studies where they also used urodynamics, this percentage was much higher, 63%. More girls than boys are affected. And when you look at the relative risk of recurrent urinary tract infections, it was also very clear that the risk of recurrence is much higher in patients with reflux and bladder or bowel dysfunction compared to the ones who didn't have that. They also looked at the rate of constipation and 30% of all these patients had constipation. So in conclusion, almost half of the patients with primary reflux have bladder bowel dysfunction and uh, that increases the risk of urinary tract infections. <coughs> so all toilet trained children presenting with UTI with or without reflux should be assessed for bladder bowel dysfunction, which will, which will uh, have a great impact on the further management. This is just a slide I want to show you of a urodynamic study in a child with both bladder overactivity, as you can see, and poor relaxation of the sphincter during voiding with residual urine. And this is typical for dysfunctional voiding and reflux in this particular case. So we presented the uh, European guidelines on reflux for the first time in European urology in 2012. And that was also particularly interesting because we focused on bladder dysfunction in regard to the treatment options. Now the goals of treatment of reflux are to prevent urinary tract infections, renal scarring, and the long-term sequelae like hypertension, impaired renal function, etc. And we want to do that by the least invasive means to preserve maximum renal function and prevent hypertension and other sequelae. Now, what are the options? Surveillance, active surveillance, antibiotic prophylaxis, or surgery. And of course, we can do it now endoscopically. We can do it by open reimplant, and we can do it laparoscopically with or without the robot. This is just a simple drawing of the endoscopic treatment. Most people nowadays use something like Deflux or Dexcel, probably, to create back support of the ureter with an increased coaptation, a longer tunnel, and distal fixation. And there are different techniques. The hit technique and the double hit technique are probably the most common. You can also use the um, extra vesicle repair, like the lichtkeg wire repair. And nowadays, that is the technique that is usually performed during laparoscopic or robot-assisted uh, uh, treatments. Uh, you can also do it in an open fashion, for instance, when you have duplex systems. The backside of this uh, kind of repair is that it is a little bit less successful than the Cohen or the Polytano Ledbetter. And, and when you do it on both sides at the same time, the children have to be warned that voiding could be difficult. They may go into retention. Usually it's temporary. So lower urinary tract dysfunction plays a significant role in the etiology of reflux and the re uh, resolution of this dysfunction will help resolve reflux but it plays an even more significant role for the occurrence of recurrent infections. So when you correct bladder bowel dysfunction, you will have less infections on top of better resolution of the reflux. And usually this is done 
in combination with any of the other options. But most important, it is to develop an individualized treatment plan based on patient risk, stratification, compliance of the family, and access to care. Now, a very interesting Cochrane ref uh, review was published last year on treatment outcomes, and they looked at the different options that we have available nowadays. They looked at 34 studies, 4,000 patients, uh, and the common outcome parameters. Now, what is true for continuous antibiotic prophylaxis is that there is an increased likelihood of bacterial drug resistance, which might be an issue. But there is no significant difference compared to no treatment or surgery, except that surgery at the end of the day shows less febrile urinary tract infections. But as far as scar development is concerned, there are no differences. So what we have done in the guidelines is that we have divided all the patients in three different risk groups. Um, and for each risk group, the mode of presentation, the initial management, and the follow-up is outlined. And we have this for the high-risk group, the moderate-risk group, and also for the low-risk groups. And the low-risk groups probably are, as numbers is concerned, the most frequently seen patients. Now, the bottom line is that there is no single recipe for all reflux patients. You need to do a risk analysis for the individual patients. You have to look at potential risk factors for renal damage or recurrent febrile UTIs. And the aim is to prevent these recurrent infections and prevent renal damage with a minimum of diagnostic and intervention for morbidity and cost. Many of the patients are diagnosed at a very young age. Majority of them are boys, and it is very safe at this moment to put them on antibiotic prophylaxis for the first year. We know that reflux is a significant risk factor for clinical pyonephrysis and renal scarring. The other bowel dysfunction is common in toilet trained children presenting with UTI with or without reflux in about 50%. 30% of them have constipation. And the presence of both that of bowel dysfunction and reflux doubles the risk of recurrence of UTI. And therefore, all children presenting with reflux and UTI should be evaluated for the presence of that of bowel dysfunction and manage accordingly. Lower urinary tract dysfunction reduces spontaneous resolution of reflux and the success rate of endoscopic injection therapy for reflux. It also increases the risk of UTI in children undergoing surgical therapy for reflux, irrespective of surgical success. An assessment and treatment of low urinary tract dysfunction is imperative in the medical and surgical management of children with reflux. I'm quite sure that the controversy about evaluation and management will continue, but one thing is clear. Patient risk stratification to define patients who need extensive evaluation and management is absolutely necessary. And the benefit of that will be that we will have fewer children who have unproductive evaluations and imaging tests and a more efficient identification of those in need of therapy. Thank you. And now I think there's some time for questions. Thank you, Reen. That was a very elegant and concise lecture on reflux. You very elegantly showed to us, actually, that the, the scar formation rates, the outcome in, in terms of scar formation is similar in all different treatment groups. And we always approach patients with medical management. Can you tell us when do you think the medical management would be inappropriate and consider 
doing some anti-reflex uh, intervention. Oh yeah, Sarah, thank you. Um, I think that there are groups of patients, um, even very young patients, who have high-grade reflux, breakthrough infections, or the ones that cannot comply with conservative management, that there definitely is a place for surgery. So it's not like uh, it doesn't make any difference where you put them on antibiotics or surveillance or do an operation that that doesn't make any difference. And that's one of the difficulties with all the trials and the randomized controlled trials. The people who enter these trials actually do not reflect the majority of patients that we see in daily practice. So it is always very difficult to draw firm conclusions from those trials and translate them to actual life. Now I think that most of us would agree that uh, because the majority of newborns are boys with reflux, usually they have high grade reflux, uh, from the Sweden studies we know that about 60% have a bladder dysfunction initially, Sometimes that disappears, and then you can see a very high spontaneous resolution rate in particularly those very young boys. So in my practice, I would say that even in boys with high-grade reflux, when they're not one year old, I will put them on antibiotic prophylaxis for some time and then see what happens. And you'll be surprised that a lot of these boys don't need surgery at all. Then there is another group, older children uh, as well, who have high-grade reflux, uh, who do not take their medication well or have breakthrough infections with fever. And I think then it is very important to do a surgical correction. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I keep receiving many questions from the participants. I will try to combine all the questions. Okay. Uh, once you start prophylaxis and everything is going well, there are no breakthrough infections, nothing. Till what time you, you maintain prophylactic therapy or man medical management? When do you stop it? Well, I, I use, I try to, well, there are a couple of things. Uh, as far as the young children are concerned, it is very important to realize that during the first year of life, the kidneys are very, uh, vulnerable and susceptible to urinary tract infections. So you don't want to have that during that period. And for practical reasons, um, I would like to keep them on antibiotic prophylaxis until they are toilet trained and then take them off. Okay. If you think you need some anti-reflex intervention, how would you choose it between endoscopic treatment, open surgery or laparoscopic? What's your criteria? Well, I think the lower grades of reflux, I mean, the grades one and two rarely ever need surgical correction. <coughs> but the three, four, three and four grades can be treated endoscopically quite well if you have the experience. Uh, my success rate in grade five, so the very severe dilated refluxing ureters, I'm not very successful with the endoscopic management, so I usually do an open procedure, either a Cohen or a Lichtgeig wire. And uh, I have no experience personally in laparoscopic anti-reflex procedures. What is the earliest age you would do surgery, if you're gonna do open surgery? Well, it depends a little bit, you can do it, I mean, we were trained to do it in extremely young children, uh, but because of the high spontaneous resolution in the majority of those young children, we wait until they are about one year, a, uh, one year old. But if need be, you can do it earlier if you want to do that. Okay. Uh, if you're going to use prophylaxis, which, what kind of drugs or what are your options? Which drug would you use? Well, you can use trimetoprim, uh, which is quite safe, even for very young children. Uh, there is a great, uh, somewhat higher uh, risk of uh, 
insensitivity, drug resistance in uh, trimetoprim, and also from the uh, Cochrane review, nitrofluentoin is a very safe drug uh, with very few uh, resistance uh, developing, so uh, either one of them. But some children, especially young children, when they have an acute infection and you need to treat it with ampicillin or something like that, um, I mean, there's a whole range of drugs available. I don't Please see any questions from the audience. Well, uh, there are too many. Probably you're not looking at the right place where there's the questions. Uh, I see, I, I, I see well, a lot. I, I don't see anything. Okay. All right. Uh, there, what about the use of laxatives? When do you think you need use of laxatives? Is it, is it good well, to use laxatives? Oh, yeah, sure. You? I mean, bladder bowel dysfunction, especially uh, bowel dysfunction, has a very important role in function of the bladder. So if you have severe constipation, you need to either put the child on a diet use laxatives or some other uh, medication to get rid of the constipation. Absolutely. Okay. Do you need to do your dynamic study in all reflux patients if you're going to operate on them? Uh, well, we used to do that. Nowadays, if they're toilet trained, I will let them do a flow, a, a voiding diary, residual urine, and if the bladder wall is not thickened, uh, because that may be an indication of some underlying pathology. Uh, I don't do uh, urodynamic studies routinely anymore. No. So it's not necessary to do it at all. If you're going to do endoscopic treatment, uh, what material you think is the best? Uh, well, there is done, uh, the Cochrane group also looked at that in a different uh, review. And strangely enough, they found that macroplastic, and not a lot of us are using that anymore. Is it available? Uh, it is still available, I think, in some countries, okay. not in mine. But uh, that, that actually was, as far as resolution of reflux, uh, one of the better drugs. <coughs> but uh, I'm using uh, deflux most of the time. Or Dexel is a good alternative. And, uh, so that's my answer to that. Okay. Uh, it's already been half hour. This yeah, I think we have time. to switch. Yeah, to we the have next to stop call. here. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I will try to cover three topics. The first two is UPJ, urethropelic junction obstruction, and then the mega ureter. Uh, well, this is the condition, urethropelvic junction obstruction. You have an obstruction at the urethropelvic area, which causes dilatation, hydronephrosis, and in some kidneys, it may deteriorate renal function. In the past, we would see those patients mostly symptomatic early or late afterward with clinical symptoms. But nowadays, most of them are diagnosed in utra with prenatal hydronephrosis. And some of them can still be diagnosed after birth by ultrasound incidentally. But majority of them are asymptomatic patients. What are the general principles when we have an hydronephrosis or dilatation? This is true for UPJ obstruction or also mega ureter. This is just an image. This is what we see. And it does not always mean that it's obstructed. It could be a sign of obstruction at the UPJ level or at the ureterovesical ju uh, junction, or it could be due to reflux because the urine is coming back to the ureter and causing it to dilate, or it could be a sign of lower tract dysfunction, and the high pressure within the lower tract can cause, can cause upper tract dilatation. And most of the time, it could be insignificant. It's just some dilatation without any increased pressure within the collecting system which would eventually impair renal function. So most of the time we see it in the prenatal ultrasound. Then when the baby is born, we have an asymptomatic baby. And at this moment, we need to decide whether this is any significant. Is it due to a bladder or urethral valve problem? Or is it a mega ureter or a UPJ or a reflux? So the, the first thing we need to do most of the time 
is uh, a differential diagnosis. And we need to be looking at all different uh, areas of the renal unit, and that should always include the bladder because there are times that when the bladder, there's bladder dysfunction or an outlet obstruction, you may see upper tract dilatation. If it is due to a bladder problem, you would often see the problem in both kidneys. So we need, our responsibility is to do the differential diagnosis, to, to define what causes the dilatation, then we need to define the prognosis. And defining prognosis will help us to make the decision whether we need to intervene or do surgery. So what is obstruction? Obstruction is the condition that we need to correct. And during, if, during the follow-up, there is progression of dilatation and there is loss of renal function. That is the best definition of obstruction. But it is, of course, better if you can pick those patients before any loss of renal function takes place. So we need to be looking at some factors to foresee if this problem will cause any renal deterioration or renal damage in the future so that we can intervene early and prevent any renal damage. So we have asymptomatic patients. We're going to be running some diagnostic tests and we're gonna make our differential diagnosis, whether it's a UPJ problem or a mega ureter or reflux, or we need to see if this is a normal condition or an insignificant condition that we shouldn't do anything. In the, well, the whole thing is at the end of the day is we need to decide whether we need to do surgery or not. Let's look at the, how we manage those patients by looking at a kid or a patient. This is a healthy newborn baby girl diagnosed with bilateral hydronephrosis prenatally during ultrasound screening at 28 weeks of gestation. So the mom and parent, the mom and the dad has been informed about this problem. And after the baby is born, you're asked to see the baby and you're going to make your uh, recommendation how to manage the baby. The first thing we do after birth in most of those patients, we put them on prophylaxis with amoxicillin per 30 milligram per day. This is to prevent any urinary tract infection taking place early. And you can stop that later if you're considered that the problem is insignificant. And we don't even need to do any creatinine evaluation or any renal function test, unless this is a bilateral condition. What is the first investigation we should do and when we should do it? Most of the time, if there is a prenatal autonomy, uh, uh, hydronephrosis, most uh, OBGYN person or some pediatricians would suggest to do ultrasound immediately. Well, we can do ultrasound, renal scan and ECG, and it's important when we should do it. Well, the teaching is we need to do ultrasound first, not as soon as possible, because it's not going to give us proper good information. Because early on, the kidneys are not functioning well, there's an oliguria period, where the urine formation is not at the normal level. So you may actually miss any hydronephrosis at this time. So we'd like to look at it after three days. Within the first week, five, six, seven days would be an ideal time to do the ultrasound. And you can consider other uh, diagnostic uh, modalities, renal scan and VCG later. When we do the ultrasound, what are we going to look at? Okay, for this baby, we look at the ultrasound on the affected side, and we look at, the, look at the kidney morphology, and we do some measurements. You can make many measurements on the kidney when you do an ultrasound. You can see the ultrasound of an hydronephrotic kidney. You can see all different kinds of measurements you can take. You can look at the parenchymal thickness. You can look at the different dimensions of the, of the pelvis. You can look at the calyceal dimensions, uh, everything. But the best thing or the most reliable <coughs> measurement we do is what we call is the AP diameter, anterior posterior diameter, when the kidney is transversely cut on ultrasound imaging. So this is the diameter we are looking at. You can also check the parenchymal thickness and other measurements of the kidney when you're doing that. So this is a longitudinal cut ultrasound imaging of the kidney 
We don't do any measurements here. Maybe just look at the longitudinal uh, diameter of the, of the, the measurement of the kidney. But most important is this one, when you do the transverse cut on the kidney and you measure the AP diameter right at the level when the parenchyma is ending. So this is the most reliable and common measurement we do, which is the AP diameter. It is important that you do the AP diameter, also mention whether the dilatation of the pelvis is more in the outside or outside. Like in this case, if the, the AP diameter is much more than the regular AP diameter at the parenchymal level outside, this is what we call is extra renal renal pelvis or extra renal hydronephrosis, which is good because that reduces the pressure uh, within the system and the parenchyma is less affected. If you see actually that the, the collecting system diameter is much more inside the kidney, which is which we would call as intrarenal hydronephrosis, then in this case, uh, the risk of parenchymal damage and parenchymal thinning is more. And you, can, you should also mention about this kind of uh, morphology when you look at the AP diameter. And also, uh, we also classify the calicyl dilatation using the SFU grading. With the SFU grading, if there is no hydro, it's grade zero. If the pelvis is hardly visible like a line, it's grade one. If the, the pelvis is quite visible, it's grade two. In grade three, we start seeing calicyl dilatation. And in grade four, we have parenchymal thinning. So the SFU grading has been shown to be the reliable and the standard method of defining the whole hydronephrosis. And in addition to this, we also need to look at the ureter and not only at the kidney level, but also at the bladder level and see if there is any ureteric dilatation. If there is ureteric dilatation accompanying to the hydronephrosis in the kidney, that could be a good sign of reflux when the bladder is full, or it could be a good sign of UEJ or an obstruction at the ureterovesical junction. And when we do the ultrasound, we need to do serial studies during the periodic follow-up, and you need to make sure that there are consistent findings, or you have to look at if there's any progression. And in case that there is a progression, that could be a good indication for you to intervene. And you have to look at it in relation to other dynamics. And the most important is the bladder fullness. You should be looking at the kidney when the bladder is full and after the bladder is empty. And it's one single rule is that no single study that includes all ultrasound studies will give you a reliable information. And you need to do serial studies at different times and see how consistent the findings are and see if any progress, uh, progression is taking place. So this is uh, an ultrasound. Uh, this is a SFU grade two hydronephrosis of the left kidney at 33 weeks of gestation. This is after the baby is born. You can see in the first day of life, I told you this is not going to be very informative and you see that hydronephrosis is gone because there is no urine, urine being formed at this time. Uh, and this is the left kidney. But on the first week, you can see quite high hydronephrosis. This is at least grade three and see there is some parenchymal thinning here. So you, you should, uh, somebody would call it as grade four as well but I would say this is SFU grade three. Then you follow the patient at fourth month, you see that hydronephrosis is going down and uh, it, the grade is going down. So when you do serial studies, you'll be able to see uh, how important this hydronephrosis is and how uh, significant it is to make any renal damage. So serial ultrasounds they are extremely important. What is our algorithm? when we approach a patient with prenatal hydronephrosis. So initially, we need to make our differential diagnosis. For the make the initial uh, differential diagnosis, most often you need a VCG to exclude the patient with reflux and for urethral valves. If there's no reflux, then you look at the group of patients with high-grade hydronephrosis, which is SFU grade three and four, and we look at the AP diameter. 
There are many studies who looked at the AP diameter, and AP diameter has been shown to be a good indicator for progressive renal damage. If the AP diameter is more than 20 till 29, the risk of operation in the follow-up is about 30%. That means there is a risk of 30% that there's gonna be some kidney damage and you need to intervene. And this number is 40% for 30 to 39 millimeters. And from 39 to 49, this goes up to 90%. So AP diameter is a very good indicator. And if there is uh, the, the AP diameter is more than 50 millimeters, most of them will require surgery. And actually when you do the scan, you'll see that most of them will have dif uh, differential renal function very poor. If the SFU grade is less, like grade one and two, we would not even look at the AP diameter in those cases, we would just follow it. So why we, when do we need, and why we need VCUG? Okay, we need UCG to exclude reflux, to exclude posterior valves or any bladder pathology. So basically you need to exclude any problem below the UVJ level and to make sure that uh, the hydronephrosis is not due to that. Let's look at this patient who has had prenatal diagnosed hydronephrosis. And this is the picture, ultrasound, three weeks after birth, looks normal, but initially the patient had hydronephrosis in utero, but looks normal. And we, I told you that we need to do serial studies. And we did a serial study about a month later on this child. This is eight week of uh, life and you see the ultrasound, the same kidney, you see the hydronephrosis. So there is an increasing hydro, very clear. And actually when you look at the bladder of that study, and this is the bladder full, you can see the ureter as well. So the ureter here dilated and also this portion of the ureter also dilated. And actually when you go back and investigate that study, the difference between two studies are, is that this study was done when the bladder was empty, and this study was done when the bladder was full. So it is very important that you do the study when both when the bladder is full and empty, because when the bladder is full and you see the ureters, that's a very good sign that there's a reflux. And actually this patient is undergone a VCG and there's bilateral reflux. So if you see ureteric dilatation, uh, we would always consider doing VCG. And if you see any bladder issues, bladder problems, thickened wall, bladder, uh, diverticula, or any cortical thinning or cortical damage in the kidney, if you do the ultrasound, then you should consider doing VCG uh, because the risk of having reflux is very high. Generally, in, in prenatal hydronephrosis, the risk of having reflux changes from 20 to 25%. Uh, and most of them are low grade and they have high resolution rate and scars are generally congenital. So we don't need to diagnose them all. So we should be selective in doing VCG. What about the uretic renogram? When do we need it? You like to do it after the first month of life because then it becomes a reliable technique. We usually like to use the MAC3. And in the first two minutes, three minutes, we look at the parenchymal uptake and look at the differential renal function. Then we do the prosemic and see how the, the isotope is being washed out. And we looked at the curves and the T half times. And curves are good, important. And if you see a sudden washout, this is normal. If, see, if you don't see any washout and there's uh, increasing collection within the collecting system, that is a good sign of obstruction. And in some cases, you see that there's some stasis or the washout is a bit later. But more important in the study is that we look at the differential renal function. If one side is affected, and you can compare the uptake of the MAC3 on that side compared to the other one, and you can see the differential renal function. If the differential renal function is less than 40%, the other side being 60%, that is a sign that kidney is seriously being affected. It's worse if the numbers are low. But most people will take 40% as the cutoff. And if the kidney is less than 40%, we would consider that this kidney has already been damaged or is under risk and we would consider intervening. And here's one case here. Uh, you can see the left side, there's hydrophosis. You can see that the washout is very poor, whereas the other side is good. And you can see on the scan that there is 
stasis of the eye stop in that kid. And when you look at the differential learning function, they are almost equal. So that actually shows that there's not already any problem in the kidney or any on the renal function loss, but that looks obstructed. Having an obstructed curve by itself is never an indication to do surgery. You need to combine all other findings, and this is just only one finding that will help you to make decision, but we never rely on one obstructed curve to do surgery. You need to do serial studies and see if there is any functional loss. So let's um, define the group who are at low risk for further renal damage and they would, how often they would need surgery. If the AP diameter is less than 20 and the SFU grade is less than four, and this has been confirmed in serial ultrasounds and on the scan, the no, there's normal renal function, the DRF, the differential renal function is equal, these patients will have low risk. And we do follow up by serial ultrasounds. Maybe you may consider repeating your MAC3 in a year or so. And in this low risk group, if the renal function goes down below 40%, there are symptoms and there's continuous hydro, then you would consider doing surgery. And the risk of having surgery in this low risk group is about 10 to 15%. So, so this is pretty low. And what about the high risk group? If the AP diameter is more than 20 and the hydronephrosis is more than grade four, and the differential renal function values may vary, and they have obstructed curves. This is what we would name as the high risk group. And we would do surgery if the hydrate hydronephrosis persists and the, the renal function goes down below 40. And if there is a solitary kidney and the, the pathology is bilateral, we would consider doing operation. And we would consider doing operation in the surveillance if hydronephrosis keep increasing, the differential function goes down continuously. There's contralateral compensation in the contralateral kidney. And if there are symptoms, we would do surgery. But again, we would never rely on one obstructive curve to do surgery. And the most common surgery we would do, most people, what pediatric urologists consider doing Anderson Heinz phyloplasty, is simply take out the obstructed area and do an anastomosis. That's quite a simple surgery, and most often we would do it in newborns, and you can do it with dorsal lumbar incision. You can see actually, you can do it with a two and a half centimeter incision very easily. And you don't really uh, need a minimal invasive surgery in that group, especially for the first one or two years of age. And most people would leave a JJ stent, you know, there are other forms of diversion early on, and the outcome is nearly 100% successful. And one other issue that I will talk is a mega ureter. Mega ureter, I mean, the general philosophy is similar to UTJ, uh, but mega ureter is mainly a descriptive term that it, ureter is larger than the normal, and the, any ureter uh, that is above seven millimeters diameter would be considered as a mega ureter. And you need to know why this is dilated? Is it due to some anatomic obstruction? And what are the risks for clinical problems and renal impairments? And when do you think you need to intervene? So you need to be looking at different points. First, you need to look at the UVJ, whether this is causing any obstruction or sometimes it's due to reflux. And you need to be looking at the bladder pre pressure, if the bladder pressure is the sole reason to cause ureteric dilatation. And you need to be able to understand how peristaltic activity is taking place. What is the diameter of the ureter at different portions of the ureter? And of course, you need to understand the wall compliance. Because uh, what is happening in the ureter when you have dilatation, when you have larger ureters in diameter, actually, this is reducing the pressure. So hydronephrosis does not mean always that this is bad. It actually lowers the pressure and protects the kidney. So you need to understand that dilated ureter is actually having any high pressure urine inside or not. And if you have continuous peristalsis, that there is a good sign that the ureter is not actually within a high pressure state. And most of the time, there is a peristaltic component at the distal ureter, 
which is not uh, allowing a good flow of urine and the rest of the uterus pretty much dilated. And not all of them will require surgery because not all of them will build up pressure inside the ureter and cause renal damage. And we classify mega ureters as two parts, the refluxing ones and the non-refluxing ones. When you have a refluxing mega ureter, we would consider doing surgery on them following the re, uh, principles of the VUR, like Green has mentioned to us. And, but some of them could be at the same time obstructed. This is the group which, which would need surgery early on. When you have the fluxing mega ureter and obstructing one at, at the same time, this is not good for the kidneys and you have to intervene early. And the non-refluxing group, there is a big group, which we would call is non-obstructing group. They don't have any obstruction. There's no pressure within the ureter that is high that would cause any kidney damage. And there is, of course, another group, which is the obstructing one, which would need intervention. And again, like UPJ, they can come asymptomatic and symptomatic, and most of them are asymptomatic, picked up by ultrasound prenatally. And when you have the mega ureter, we do the ultrasound to see the morphology. We do VCG to understand the bladder problem and if there's reflux. We do scan again to see the differential renal function in the washout. In addition to the other, we may consider doing MR urography if we think that the anatomy is a bit complex, or especially if there's a duplex system or some sort of an ectopic ureter or something, is some additional congenital anomaly you would consider doing MR urography. The whole idea when we do investigation as such, we want to exclude bladder dysfunction or any obstruction. And again, we need to do serial studies. When we have a prenatal diagnosed mega ureter, uh, anything that is above seven millimeter should be further investigated. All should under the ultrasound. All should have ECG to exclude deflux. All with grade two, three and four hydro should undergo a MAC3 to understand differential renal function and see the washout curve. And, and, and so that we can understand what the, the underlying problem is. I'm gonna share with you a couple of pictures. Here you see the VCG. You can see high grade reflux. And as soon as you start filling the bladder in, there's reflux of the kidneys. So this is a refluxing mega ureter. But after the, the bladder is empty, what you see here, the kidneys are not emptying well. So the ureter, there's stasis of, of opaque material within the ureter. This is a mega ureter, which is refluxing and obstructing one. And most of them would need to be intervened earlier. It's another one. After uh, reflux, you don't see a washout of the opaque material into the bladder. And this is another one. And here we see another one. There's reflux into the system, but you can see a long obstructed segment so this is, again, an obstructing and defluxing mega ureter. We have this patient who had an IVP. This is an old classical patient, and I just want to share this IVP with you. We don't do IVPs anymore, though. This is a two-month baby boy with prenatal hydro. You can see the dilated mega ureter. And this patient had a grade three hydro in the kidney, so it was not high, and this ureter was 80 millimeters and there was no VCG on the, uh, no reflux on the VCG. So we follow the patient, and this is the MAC3. You can see there's some stasis. The washout is a bit late, but there is washout, and the differential renal function is 46 to 54. It's not bad. And in time, we follow the patient. You can see the washout is similar throughout the follow-up, but no clinical problems, but the patient has been on antibiotic prophylaxis, and in the long run, after four years of age, there's another IVP showing actually there's a resolution of that mega ureter. If there are no clinical problems, no reflux, no obstruction, a good drainage, no deterioration of renal function, there are no symptoms, no urinary tract infection, we would do a mega ureter uh, with conservative management. And you can see from that study, about one third will show there's uh, improvement, one third will show persistence, but it will stay, remain stable. Some of them will get worse, and actually about 12% would need to be operated on. And that study looking at different groups of patients, and actually they've been able to see 80% spontaneous regression of the mega ureters 
but all the ones initially presented with a diameter, distal ureteric diameter less than 8.5 shown spontaneous regression, but there has been none above 50 millimeter which showed spontaneous regression. So initial diameter of the ureter seems to be an important one. Here is one other patient, another IVP. Uh, this is six month, a solitary kidney, nothing else done because the creatinine was 0.3, everything was normal. So after nine years, you can see the resolution. What is happening? Is the obstruction going away or what? Probably there is no obstruction. It is just the elasticity on the ureteric wall. The compliance of the ureteric wall changes with its collagen content and other viscoelastic properties. So the ureteric wall becomes more, uh, more elastic and more compliant and, and the, the, uh, the diameter goes down and the kidney is protected. There are some patients presenting at later ages and most often they would pre present with a stone in the mega ureter. Here we have another mega ureter. You can see this is an obstructed and refluxing mega ureter and another one here. And in that group, and this is an ectopic ureter, a mega ureter, most of them would do a ptonostomy. Once you do the ptonostomy, you would relieve the kidney and you can wait till the end of one year of age and consider doing reimplantation later on. And when you do reimplantation, we like to resect the distal mega ureter and we like to remodel the mega ureter and we do an entire reflux implant. There are different ways that you would do remodel. This is the folding technique or you can taper. And basically what you need to do, you reduce the diameter of the ureter so that you can easily reimplant the, the ureter into the kidney, uh, into the bladder. And you, you don't need to create very long tunnels and when you have a much smaller diameter, all you need is four times the diameter to create a good tunnel. And this has been uh, a Cohen procedure after the diameter of the ureters uh, downsized with the modeling. Okay, uh, I will stop here for this part of the talk and um, uh, I will move on to the hypospadias talk, all right? Okay, I will just go through the algorithm. Uh, when you have hypospadias at birth, first thing we do, we exclude the DST, a, a disorder of sexual differentiation. Then the surgery should be done by a pediatric urologist. And you need to look at where the, uh, the beatus located, like in this, this hypospadias, if there's cordia or not, and, yeah, and what the, the uh, general morphology of the penis is like. You need to be able to evaluate all different components of the penis. You have to make a very good evaluation of different components, including the glands, the ureter plate, uh, the location of the meatus, the different, the distance from the meatus uh, to the top, and presence of core D. By doing all those evaluations, you're going to be choosing the right technique for the right anatomy. And here you're looking at the ventral tissue. Sometimes the meatus is too distal. But, but since the ventral tissue is still thin, we need to do some other surgery. And we need to decide the surgery after we deglove the ureter, like we do it here. After the degloving, you can see the penis is, is out there. Initially, what we see is a mid-penile hypospadias is actually quite distal now. Here in this case, you can see the location of the meatus. It is right behind, below the glands, but there is a little bit of core D. And what we do after the gloving, actually you can see that this, there's a short urethra and the urethra plate is too low. And, and this was the reason why he had cordy and he had to cut the urethra plate. And when you do it, you can see actually the original meatus uh, was here, but now down below, that turns into a very uh, proximal hypospadias. We don't like to do the classification according to the location of different Meatuses, as I've shown you, the location on the meatus can be misleading. Uh, you have to look at all different components. And we like the, uh, the hypospadias mild, wherein it's glandular or penile hypospadias, or severe when you have penoscrotal hypospadias associated with cordy and some scrotal abnormality. So when we have the diagnosis of birth, we exclude the ST. And when you exclude the ST, actually, either you have severe hypospadias um, and some problem 
in one of the testicles. If you have that, you have to do search for a DSD. Otherwise, it's a regular hypospadias, and we suggest that hypospadias should be done by pediatric urologists or with those people who have enough experience in this. And here is one patient. You can see this is very distal. The question is whether that needs to be operated or not. And the reason why we like to operate on very distal ones is because the calibration and the projection of the urine may not be correct. And this is the reason why we would do surgery even if it's very distal. Defining the anatomy is extremely important, so you're going to be choosing the right surgery for the right anatomy. And this is a distal one. And we like to do the surgery around this urethra plate. We know that this area is not very healthy and sclerotic tissue. We like to approach this area uh, dissecting other tissues, and we need to create enough vascular support to this area when we are going to be doing surgery on that part. This is very dyslipospadias, and another one here, you see a bridge here, which is, could be a sign that actually you can easily do a MAPPI procedure here. The same here, and another one here. You can see the urethral plate here, and the meatus is here. Uh, the ideal age is from 6 to 24 months. We'd like to do the surgery before two years of age, <clears throat> but not earlier than six months because there is no added risk of anesthesia after six months and there's been sufficient development of the penis. Okay, let's take a look at the distal hypospadias. We have different procedures that we employ. We're going to be looking at that case only and what procedure we're going to be using that case. And you can see the, the meatus is here. There's good urethral plate, good ventral tissue. <coughs> and this is what I like to do is the incision when I'm going to do the tipu repair. But of course, you can many, do many other repairs. Like Matthew repair is another one, which is a very popular operation. Many people stop doing it, but it's been shown to be a very effective procedure. In the Matthew procedure, what you do is you bring a flap to cover the urethral plate and form the neo-urethra. Nowadays, we mostly do the tipu repair or the slot grass repair. In that case, I'm going to show you how we do it. Uh, this is the initial uh, incision that I like to do. And after that incision, we do the degloving and we go under the glandular wings. And by doing that, we isolate the urethral plate. And when you go into the glandular wings, you should be aware of the spongiosum going lateral and not go into that spongiosum and prevent bleeding. So you should be making your dissection under the wings lateral to the spongiosum. And then you do incision on the urethral plate to make it wider. And when you have urethra, make the incision on the urethral plate right here, you have a wide open urethral plate. And then we uh, tubularize that. And the way we tubularize it, we do horizontal mattress stitches like this. We do the stitches outside the mucosa, inverting the mucosa. Here, you can see how we do the stitching on each side. This is the horizontal mattress. You can see that stitch is going outside the mucosa on the adventitial tissue, and the same on that side. So we're actually inverting the mucosa. And on the second layer, we do Lambert stitches. You can see a watertight closure of the urethral plate. Then you bring a dartos flap, mostly from the dorsal aspect of the penis, like here, and create the second closure. Or here you can see how to prepare the dartos layer. And in this case here, we have urethral plate. It doesn't look wide enough, so you may consider doing something else. Here we made the incision. Then you can bring a graft, what we call a slot graft procedure. You do an inlay graft, and you can make it wider and more uh, in terms of uh, better with mucosa, and you can employ the same treatment after the inlay graft. And this is the closure of the skin. And this has been a very efficient operation. The only problem with that operation in the long run has been some uh, distal uh, stenosis, uh, but this has not been shown to be very clinically important. You may have some urochromatic with obstructive curves, but that doesn't always mean that this uh, uh, urethra or distal urethra is obstructed. Thank you for your attention. So, Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, a masterful couple of presentations covering uh, some uh, 
difficult topics, I think. Um, we've got a number of questions that have come in. I'm going to start. Uh, the, the questions are largely focused on the um, the first of your talks, really uh, about the ureters and the hydrogen process. Um, one of the questions is: Do you need to give prophylactic antibiotics in non-refluxing, non-obstructed mega, mega ureters? Do you think? Okay, uh, we don't we don't have a very good answer to that question. We did a uh, systematic analysis in our group, the guidelines group, and we looked at whether we need to do prophylaxis in the UPJ or the mega ureter group. It looks like it's wise to do prophylaxis, especially in the high-grade hydrogen process group, although there's no reflux. Uh, I personally like to do uh, prophylaxis at least for the first year of life to prevent any, any urinary tract infection. I consider this as a very safe approach, uh, but after that, I stop it. The, uh, there's a sort of follow-up question to that. Somebody was asking that, I think you mentioned amoxicillin. Is that a personal preference? Is that... Uh, no, amoxicillin early on is the only antibiotic that you can use because in the first six, eight weeks of life, this is the best antibiotic that could be absorbed from the gut. The other option, like trimetoprim, will not be absorbed well because the bile salts are not formed enough in the gut and the, the absorption of this trimetoprim depends on the formation of the bile salts. So uh, giving trimetoprim early in life is not very good. So amoxicillin or penicillin is the only one that you can use in the first two months of life, but you can change to timetoprin or nitroprantein later on. Okay. Um, there's a question here about, uh, do you ever use um, uh, temporary nephrostomies for severe hydronephrosis? Well, temporary hydronephrostomy uh, is a good one in the acute cases, but maintaining nephrostomy for a long time is very difficult in a baby. To keep it inside the, the, the kidney is difficult. You need to keep uh, st uh, your stay stitch or your fixation. Uh, you, you have to change or you have to keep it fixed all the time because there's gonna be a time that it will fall out by itself. Or if you can keep it inside for a long time, there's a high risk that you're gonna have infections and the most common infection would be a fungal infection. So uh, you, can, you can use nephrostomies for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, but it's not going to be there for a longer time and you will have some more complications. So we would go for a conostomy more than a nephrostomy. Okay. Um, I think you kind of answered this as part of the talk, but somebody's asked whether or not, uh, if you look at a, 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 a renogram, do you regard the split function or the, the, the drainage pattern as being most important? I think uh, the, 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 the split function is the most reliable one. It will tell you how much that kidney is affected quite objectively. When yeah. you look at the, the curve or the washout curves, there are too many factors involved in the washout curve, and it doesn't always will tell you anything about the obstruction. If you have a very dilated system, you may have an obstructed curve, although you may not have obstruction, because a very dilated system, a large hydro, will not drain well. It's like you have a big pool and a small pool and you put similar amount of dye in both pools and a similar, similar drainage system both pools. Of course, the dye will be cleared from the small pool much faster than the big pool. So uh, if you have very much dilated system, you will most of the time have an obstructed curve, which doesn't actually mean that this kidney is obstructed. I'm going to ask two questions about your second talk and then we'll move on to the final talk of the session. Um, how long do you leave a catheter after a high post BDS repair? This is a personal approach. Personally, I like to keep it for five to seven days after the TIPU repair. Uh, if I do a MACPI, it's 24 to 48 hours. Uh, I like to keep it about five to seven days for a distal proper uh, high post BDS repair. And then uh, there's just a question uh, about um, when you use DARSAS for the second layer of your urethroplasty, uh, does that ever cause penile torsion? Is that something you're concerned okay, about? You need to be cautious about this. You have to have a good dissection of this uh, DARSAS flap to the radix of the penis to prevent any rotation. Or you can do 
uh, button in the middle. So you, you can bring the penis from that button and you don't need to rotate the, uh, the dartos fascia. You can just bring the dartos fascia right on top in the midline uh, with that button off. Okay, Serdar, uh, thank you so much. A tour de force thank as you. always. Um, my job is to try and talk to you about um, perhaps some of the life or longer term effects. Um, I'm, I'm going to do that by talking about the neuropathic bladder uh, and posterior urethral valves. My job is really looking at, uh, mostly after older children or adolescents uh, and then taking them through uh, to look after them also uh, into adulthood. So let's see if we can move on. I've got no conflicts of interest relevant to this talk. So when we think about neurogenic causes, uh, these will be familiar to most of you, but uh, it's just worth thinking about them. Um, obviously, myeloma and uh, we come sometimes across, come across occult causes uh, that are more difficult to see from a physical manifestation. And they just need to be uh, in your mindset when you're thinking about people or young children with um, bladder dysfunction. There are obviously acquired causes, uh, most of them secondary to trauma, but, uh, but also, um, uh, tumours and infective causes also need to be borne in mind. One of the things that I think uh, that becomes a challenge uh, with this group of patients is really thinking about uh, some of the secondary effects and some of the things that we may have to deal with in addition to uh, just simply dealing with bladders or kidneys. Obviously, uh, um, neurosurgeons or neurologists may well be involved in their care thinking about the hydrocephalus side of things. Uh, they may well need to be physiotherapists, orthopedic surgeons involved uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, mobility or spinal deformities. But obviously, as urologists, uh, we're going to be focused on making sure that we preserve kidney function. Uh, and often we're charged with doing that by making sure that we regulate the bladder and ensure that that is safe. So these are our jobs, if you like. This is what we have to do. Uh, we have to make sure that the kidneys stay healthy. We have to uh, make sure that the bladder is empty and completely. We want a patient to be dry, if that's at all possible. Uh, and we don't want them to have urinary tract infections. All of those goals are important. Uh, and that is the ideal solution for any of these patients. When it comes to thinking about a neuropathic bladder long term, and these are the patients uh, that I would see in my clinic, um, there are many, many aspects that patients worry about. Obviously, some of them are more appropriately addressed in adulthood and in an adult clinic and would be difficult to address in a child. But there's something that parents may be thinking about. And as a child becomes an adolescent and then an adult, they will start to think about. And you can obviously see uh, the range of those on the slide in front of you. One of the things that I think becomes a particular challenge uh, as a child becomes an adolescent and an adult is really to think about their ability to make complex decisions. We know that some people with uh, neuropathic bladders will have some uh, difficulty with executive tasks, so complex decision making. Uh, and if you're particularly if you're talking about the concept of a mitrofenoff or a urinary diversion, something that they may not be familiar with, then supporting them through that decision making and trying to check their understanding can be a really important part of caring for them and making sure that you don't do something to them that either they or you later regret. We know that uh, those with a neuropathic bladder will have an effect on their upper tract if they're not managed well. We know that 20% are affected by two years and that boys uh, are at greater risk. We know that uh, they will be vulnerable, as in other talks, to urinary tract infections, largely because of their bladder dysfunction. Uh, and we know that they may be vulnerable to the psychourotech reflux. We also know that if we treat the bladder well, uh, we can mitigate a lot of this. We can make a significant difference to their long-term outcome. We know that by managing the, aggressive, the, the bladder early and aggressively, uh, that we can make a significant difference to their renal function. Some of them will still go on to need other treatments, such as cystoplasty. It's a significant bur burden for parents to undertake. Uh, but if it's done well and it's taken on early, it can be built into their regular routine and it's much less burdensome than trying to introduce that later in life. It's really important that the parents are on side with this. And if you're trying to introduce this into an old child or an adolescent, uh, that their wishes and their understanding um, are taken into account. 
uh, that you think about their ability to self catheterize and that you start with simple training, introducing it stepwise, supporting them as they do it, um, and then you stand a fighting chance of uh, some success. As they become older, continence is obviously something that will become more relevant to them. You may have adolescents or younger adolescents or older children that come in saying they're not worried about continence. As they get older, uh, they will start to worry about continence and they will start to think more about that uh, as a concern. You need to watch there. If, if they suddenly become continent, then you need to be very aware that that may uh, be a portent of a change in bladder function uh, with the risk of damage to upper tracts. We know that patients who've had just outlet procedures with no operation on their, um, on their bladder are at risk of suffering problems with their upper tracts. So what can we do? Well, we use a lot of Botox, um, both in adolescents and adults in my practice. It's a great way of controlling the bladder. And for some who don't want to think about bigger surgery for all sorts of reasons, um, then it can be something that temporizes them, gives them time to make uh, decisions about big surgery if that's what they decide that they want to do further down the line. When it comes to more complex surgery, that's something that we're familiar with, either as primary surgery or revision surgery, if things change uh, and alter as they become older. We know that we can divert urine using an ileal conduit. We know that we can make a bladder bigger or replace it entirely if we have to by using a segment of bowel. Uh, and if we need to, we can um, either connect that neobladder to the urethra in an orthotopic reconstruction or drain it by, by a um, a uh, superdragonal approach such as a Mitrofenov with a heterotopic neobladder. All of these are valid and useful uh, forms of reconstruction that we would use. Why is that important and why, why do we work so hard? Well, we know that, um, and this is work from St George's Hospital in South West London, um, that if we look after the kidneys, actually it significantly affects the outcome for these children. And this is further data from that same study. We, the mantra used to be that these children died of renal failure, that that was a major cause of death from them. And actually, if you look at these data here, you can see that none of them died from renal failure. Previous series, that's been up to a third of patients. So it's a significant difference. So all of the things that I've talked about in terms of early aggressive bladder management, managing that well, keeping an eye on it, being aware of change becomes really important and does significantly affect the outcome in the long term. We also know that big surgery comes with big consequences further down the line, and these patients are going to need following for life. And there's nothing we can do about the fact that they will need following for life. Um, if they've had a cystoplasty, if they've had a mitrofenov, if they've had a conduit, they're subject to significant change um, throughout their lives. And so keeping an eye on them, monitoring them for things like metabolic changes, stones in their bladder, helping them manage mucus and giving them tips and tricks about that means an awful lot to these patients uh, for their long-term support. So to those patients who have cystoplasties, some of them will be on an inexorable decline and will, will suffer with renal deterioration anyway, even though we use a cystoplasty to try and mitigate that. We know that they're at risk of stones. We know that they're at risk of infections. We need to be careful that they comply uh, with their need to catheterize, particularly as they go through vulnerable stages of life like adolescence. And so we need to monitor them in the long term. So if you look at the treatment options for a patient with a neuropathic bladder, there's a range of them. Some of them won't need more than anticholinergics and intermittent self-catheterization, and some of them will survive well with adjuncts such as Botox, but many will go on to need more major surgery, and all of them will need supervision um, throughout their, their adolescent and their adult life. We can use things to improve continence and we know that there are really high success rates with that. But again, uh, these guys need monitoring and supervision as they get into their adult life. So remember that with any neuropath, that what you see in terms of the level of lesion may not match with the scenario that you see. So you may need to adapt your treatment strategy depending on what you actually find from a urodynamic point of view. In our practice, we have many people who are going to adult life and obviously thinking about having children. And so we have um, the conversation about sex and we have the conversation about uh, preparation for pregnancy. And in young women with um, a myelomeningocele or with a neuropathic bladder, 
we will talk to them proactively about the use of folic acid to try and re reduce their risk of having an affected child uh, as and when they decide to have children. So for the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about posterior urethral valves uh, and the effect that that has as, as uh, children move into adult life. This slide here just demonstrates what a pan-neurological disease posterior urethral valves is. People focus on the urethra and the lesion, uh, and they may even focus on the bladder because they, they see that as being initially most important. But this dramatic picture here shows uh, a, a two sheep bladders and kidneys, uh, one of which was obstructed on your right-hand side and one of which was unobstructed on the left-hand side. That gives you an illustration of how, how much uh, a valve can affect the whole of the urinary tract. We know that that's the commonest cause of obstructive uropathy pro progressing to renal failure. Many will show improvement in earlier life and that uh, renal function tends to stabilize. But about 50% of patients, once they get to puberty, will then start to deteriorate. And we know that a third will have um, end-stage renal failure by the time they're 30. You can see on the right-hand side of your slide some of the things that we can use to predict uh, that deterioration. We know that many of these patients are picked up in utero in, uh, uh, or very early in life, but we can also find it in young men with odd voiding patterns, strange uh, urinary dysfunction uh, in their teen and early adult life. So if you have a strange presentation in a young man, it is just worth thinking about bowels as a possible cause of that. And why do we worry about it? Why do we think uh, that it's important as uh, children grow older, uh, then we've already said that a number of them will stabilize. Well, we know that if the kidneys are fu functioning badly and the bladder is vulnerable, that's a bad combination. This is a redrawing of a diagram taken from Campbell's, where you can see that with the production of more and more urine uh, and a bladder that is struggling to manage that, uh, then the bladder pressures will go up. That will affect the kidneys, that will uh, lead to further urine being produced, which will affect bladder function and therefore um, exacerbate uh, damage to the kidneys. So it all runs hand in hand. So our job as a urologist in protecting the upper tracts by looking after the bladder uh, deserves huge emphasis. Some of the historical data about posterior urethral valves shows us how vulnerable children were to death uh, and se severe limitation as a result of posterior urethral valves. Uh, this data was, or these data were published by uh, Helen Parkhouse in the late 1980s. When we look at data uh, that is more recent, we can see that um, we have not seen a huge improvement in outcome. And that relates to some of the comments that Reen and Serda have made earlier, that actually, a lot of the time the die is cast, these patients uh, have had significant um, renal damage very early uh, in their pregnancy in utero uh, and recovering from that isn't possible. So what we're left with is managing the fallout of that uh, and dealing with that as they move into later life. We can see that when we pick up patients uh, in later life, things to look for uh, in this table here from Tina Shaver's paper uh, shows us that We've got patients with nocturnal enuresis, which is what NE stands for there. And about two thirds of these patients will present with nocturnal enuresis. Some will have urinary frequency, odd voiding patterns, um, diurnal enuresis, and so on. Uh, all of these things are potential portents um, and were found in patients with, um, with posterior urethral valves. So what can we do about it? Well, one of the things that we believe at UCLH is working jointly with our nephrological colleagues because there are different aspects to the management in the long term that are beneficial for the patient. So first of all, as a patient becomes older and they start to learn to look after themselves, teaching them about their diagnosis so that they understand it, they can explain it and they can participate in their care becomes very important. There are physical things that we can do. So we can monitor their blood pressure uh, and if necessary, treat that. And we know that that makes a difference to their rate of renal failure. It may not change ultimately their progression to end stage renal failure, but it may stave off their, their, their uh, need for a renal transplant for some time. We'll monitor things like protein creatinine ratio, we'll correct acidosis, um, we'll teach them about self catheterization and we'll look for physical problems like obstruction uh, and bladder pressures when we see changes and we need to look for those.
We were also surprised when we looked at our patient group at UCLH at how many of them have had major surgical interventions in the posterior urethral valve group. And we felt that was important to, to point out and to learn from uh, because the consequences of these um, procedures are obviously that they need even closer management and that they may have further problems. All of these seem to have been necessary and they've probably made a difference uh, to the long-term outcome as far as renal failure is concerned. But it's quite a surgical burden for any patients to, to deal with. So I've kept my talk uh, reasonably brief to allow for, for questions and discussion at the end of the session, I hope. Um, but these are my take home messages. When you're looking at these patients as they become older, a one shot view of the bladder in much the same way as Serdar and Reen has said, um, with any investigation, a one shot is usually a very difficult thing to interpret. You need to, re to regard the bladder as unreliable in the first instance. And if you have doubt about renal function or why things are changing, it's important to assess the bladder objectively using video urodynamics, using repeated measurements uh, and monitoring these people carefully. Our job as urologists is to protect and preserve renal function and uh, we need to do that with aggressive bladder ma uh, management. And you can see from some of the data I've shown in these slides that that can make a significant difference to outcome overall. Our aim is to achieve normal uh, urinary function where we possibly can. Uh, that can be difficult, it can be challenging, and we may have to use adjuncts to achieve that. But what we want is these children to grow into adults where their urological disease is to limitation to what they can achieve in the rest of their lives. These patients need lifelong care, they need support in doing that. Uh, and that really uh, is the role of myself and my team. Thank you very much for your time and listening. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one relates to the first part of your talk. What is the maximum Botox dosage that you're usually using in the adolescent patient? So we'll use botulinum toxin A. Um, we usually try and begin with a dose of 100 units um, uh, intravocically. Uh, as they grow in size or if their symptoms dictate, then we'll take that up to um, 300 units. We make sure that there's, if, we, if we're using a maximal dose like that, uh, we'll, we'll only use that, uh, or we won't use that more frequently than every three months. Um, but uh, that's, that's the kind of um, protocol that we would follow. And do you do it as an outpatient, uh, an outpatient procedure, or how do you do it? Um, I think that's more difficult in adolescent patients. Most of them hate coming to see us anyway. Some of the neuropaths uh, will be absolutely fine having it um, as an outpatient or local anesthetic procedure. Um, many of them uh, don't like hospitals much, they're a bit nervous, they're at a stage in their life where actually uh, having an operation, particularly in that area, is extremely embarrassing or difficult for them. So um, we'll offer them discretion and where, those need, where they need it, we'll perform it under um, general anaesthetic. Now there's also a question on what age do you start, but you don't see a lot of kids, do you? You see, I, I generally so. don't know. Uh, I, I tend to see the the um, the older kids and and adolescents. Okay, and then there is a question about uh, bladder rupture after an ileocystoplasty. Do you see that often? Uh, fortunately, we don't see it often. Uh, I've seen it a few times in my career. Um, it generally presents elsewhere, so some often presenting to a local hospital. And the difficulty is really if, if somebody doesn't think about it and spot it as a potential diagnosis, um, and uh, a patient then has urinary peritonitis, um, and the data around that, are that, that has about a 28% uh, mortality. So thinking a bit early, uh, making a diagnosis and treating it aggressively becomes really important. Okay, then there was the question about when you put uh, the cuff of the artificial sphincter around the bladder neck or in the bilbo urethra, do you always have to activate the sphincter in the neuropath or is it sometimes enough to just put the cuff there? No, it's certainly enough some, in some patients to just put the cuff there. And um, one of my mentors, Tony Mundy, who's, uh, who's done an awful lot of um, artificial sphincters uh, over his career uh, will quite often uh, in patients who've got a complex lower urinary tract who've had previous reconstruction just put a cuff around the, the urethra uh, 
um, allow things to settle, see if that's enough. Um, he would say that in between 30 and 50%, that's enough. Um, uh, and only then, if they need it, would he go on to put the additional components and think about activating the sphincter. Okay, a lot about early CIC. Do you need to do that in the, uh, for instance, spinovifida patient, or can you just watch them for a certain period of time? I mean, you and Sarah will probably have greater hands-on experience than that uh, in that than I. Um, I think that um, uh, certainly the urodynamics team at Great Ormond Street that I do a lot of work with, they tend to be fairly aggressive in instigating that. And the, the, the reasoning behind that is that it's much easier to teach a parent and child to take that on in early infancy than trying to introduce that in a two-year-old or a three-year-old further down the line when you realize that it's going to be a benefit. Yeah, well, that's my opinion. I'm sure that Sarah has the same opinion as well. So early start is probably the best. Now, when you have a valve patient with a non-compliant bladder, is it useful to start giving them either anticholinergics or botulinum toxin, or doesn't it work? I think it's worth trying. I think you know these are a difficult group, and they don't tolerate major in, major inter, intervention very well uh, when they're adolescents. It's sometimes necessary, uh, but trying to teach an adolescent boy to self catheterize when they need a self uh, assistoplasty or Botox uh, is a really really difficult undertaking to engage them and keep them compliant. So starting okay. with a minimal approach and escalating that. On the, on the basis of explanation, I think is the best approach for them if you can. Okay, thank you. Well, there's one last question. Is there still a place for doing a vasectomy in a valve patient? I, I mean, the answer to that is yes. I certainly see uh, my colleagues uh, in the pediatric setting uh, doing that uh, in a patient that's got severe renal function uh, with a really difficult bladder, then I think as a salvage maneuver, uh, either that or a refluxing ureterostomy is a reasonable thing to do to, to salvage um, renal function and allow recovery. So, but you do it to salvage the kidneys. It doesn't really help normal bladder development, does it? Oh, no, absolutely. It's not, it's, it's not going to help the bladder. It's really about uh, renal function and preservation. Okay. Well, those were all the questions on your topic. And I think that uh, we've all learned a lot from the different presentations. And uh, I hope that the audience uh, has the same impression and feeling. And I would like to thank both Sarah and Dan for their talks and participation. But I also would like to thank Mariella, who organized it together with Tom, who is in charge of this webinar. So thank you all very much. 